in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringing instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. They're out of town. Um, we want you to know that though you're not here, you're deeply in our hearts. And we hope that you will join in with us in worship wherever you're at. Wherever you're at. So with that said, that's enough nice and teasing and pleasant talk. Let's get in that word. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, please navigate your way to the book of Numbers 13. <coughs> Numbers 13. We're going to go 25 through 33. Somebody said earlier in the service, the preacher's been at two services, and so we'll preach extra long. Amen. How many of you want the short route? How many of you want the long route? Amen. That's the route I want. I want to obey the Lord. Amen. 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 We don't have too many scrolls for you. Of course, Moses is. Don't forget Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. So don't forget Moses is writing this. And he had spent, sent the 12 spies out to the land, the promised land. They were not entered in yet. This is their first attempt to make it in. Now, of course, they didn't make it on the first attempt. Uh, that generation died. The overarching theme of Numbers, the reason it's called Numbers, is there's two giant consensuses in here. The first consensus is the generation that didn't make it. They died in the wilderness. The second consensus is the generation that did make it. So that's why it's called Numbers. Now, numbers is a fascinating book, theologically very complicated, lots of um, square pegs that do not fit into round holes. So if you have any theological questions about Numbers, I would be glad to answer them for you. So Numbers 13, begin at verse number 25. And here's a report from the 12 spies. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. Stop by there, brother Tim. Notice 40 days. Moses is a real stickler. So is Jesus about mentioning 40 days, 40 years in the wilderness. Moses fasted 40 days up on Mount Sinai twice. Jesus fasted 40 days, 40 days in the wilderness. The book of Acts, Stephen, in one of his sermons, mentions 40 days many times. So I just thought I'd throw that in there for you as a little side note. Maybe you've read over that many times. Let's face it, how many of you read numbers at least twice a year? Right? Okay. All right. Now, you know, not many people read numbers. Uh, I guess I'm a theological nerd. Uh, so I loved, I loved numbers and, and Leviticus. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came unto Moses. Moses is writing in the third person, by the way. He's just naming himself. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and shewed them the fruit of the land. Which if you go back and read a couple verses before where we started tonight, um, one cluster of grapes 
had to be carried by two men. One theologian I studied under said that one grape could, could have possibly have been the size of a small seedless watermelon. I mean, a cluster of grapes with two men it takes a total. Pretty good, pretty good set of grapes. Could you imagine saying, son, what we're going to have for supper now? We're going to have a grape. You know, uh, we're going to have for dessert. We're going to split a grape. And I thought about that. Uh, it's a dry preacher here. I'm sorry. Don't, don't unfriend me. Don't unfriend me. I'm sorry. And they told him and said, And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us. Surely it floweth with milk and honey. This is the fruit of it, the big grape cluster. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw there, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites <clears throat> dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that were, but the men that went up with him said, "We be not able to go up against this, against the people, for they are stronger than we." And they brought up an evil report out of the land which they had searched until the children of Israel saying, "The land which we have gone to search it, search it is a land that <clears throat> eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature." Of great stature. Now I want you to pay close attention to verse number 33, please. And therefore we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, probably descendants of <clears throat> probably descendants of some sort of Goliath. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so were we. In their sight. So if I could title a sermon tonight, this message, it would be Fight for Your Promise. Fight for Your Promise. Israel did not want to fight, they wanted the easy way. Reverend Lord, that's the days we're living in. We want, we want Christianity the easy way, we want comfortable Christianity. Like we say many times, we want. We want kindergarten Christianity. We want cute Christianity. What do we say on a Sunday morning? If you're going to be like Christ, if you want to look like Christ, if you want to act like Christ, you're going to be treated like Christ. Christ was not accepted everywhere he went. See, some of you Christians, you want to be accepted everywhere you go. You want to be a Christian and you want to have standards and you want to be holy and you want to live for God and you want biblical standards, but yet you live in a corrupt cultural world. You're, I, I hate to tell some of y'all this, because some of y'all, everybody will like you. I'm going to tell you right now, if you stand up for Christ, everybody's not going to like you. You're not going to stand up for the things they stand up for in their jobs. You're going to shun those things. That don't mean you got to walk around and stare a set of spiritual stilts and look down at everybody. But at the same time, if you're treated, if you, if you want to be like Christ, you're going to be dejected. You're going to be called one of them people. You're going to be called judgmental. Uh, I, I dare say the world judges us ten times harder than what they think we judge them. Amen. If you say you're a Christian all the time, they think you're looking at the way they dress, you're looking at the way they look, and all those kind of things. So, But many Christians, because of that, Brother Tim, they turn back when they should be fighting for their promises. Amen. Amen. In our contemporary time, I'm going to say it again, we like easy Christianity. We like microwave Christianity. Shannon was in the bed. Before I left the house, and the girls are maybe a little bit contagious, so I decided to leave them at home. And so I started figuring out what I could cook. You know, when I, on, on, I don't mess around on Wednesdays. I don't accept no work on Wednesdays um, unless it's an absolute somebody's house is about to burn down. Um, I don't accept any calls hardly on Wednesday unless uh, you're going through a severe crisis in your life. My job on Wednesdays is to lay around and pray the whole day and seek God the whole day. That's why I could be so long with it. <laughs> on Wednesday. On Wednesday. 
Let me, let me stop. Let me quit messing with you. So we like, really, we like to follow Christianity 101, don't we? Nothing. We like basic stuff. Don't be challenging me. Don't make me think. You know, but you know your preacher. We're going to sermon it make Christian it. So we're not here to make Christian it. We're here to make powerful warriors. Can I get a witness? We're here to make, we're here to make promise takers. Hallelujah. Fight. Anybody here feel like fighting for your promises? Anybody still got some fight left in there for their children? Amen. Come on. Somebody give God some praise one more time. It's hard because we're used to hearing on TV, aren't we? Five ways to be blessed. Three paths to prosperity. We don't like weight. We don't like endurance. We don't like fight. We don't like to hear words like wait and possess. Hallelujah. So like these ten negative spies, many of us have a short memory when it comes to serving God. I'm still on my introduction. Give me a second. We're building up here. We, we got a short memory like these Israelites. They forgot that just a couple of years ago, God opened the Red Sea. Water out of a rock. Manna from heaven overthrew a whole army. Angels fought with them and beside them and took their lug nuts off of their chariots so they couldn't go anywhere. <clears throat> we got to be like David. That's why David was always reminding of himself that I slew the bear through the power of the Holy Spirit. I slew the lion through the power of God. Some of you need to roll back to the Rolodex of your mind. And you need to revisit those places where God brought you victory. The time where he thought you were going to go crazy in your head, but you're here today because God enabled you to slay that depression or that oppression. Somebody better give God some praise all over the house. I am convinced that Israel wanted the houses that they didn't build, but now they've had to tend the garden. See, up, up until this point, manna had fell from heaven. Water had came from a rock. Or God had made supernatural provision for them in all kinds of different ways. Now they have to hold their own garden. Now they have to keep up their own houses. No more tents and no more wandering around. Now they might have to get a job. Start making their own candles. Come on, somebody. Now they might have to go to work. That's what I'm trying to say. We like lazy Christianity. We don't want any challenging material. We don't like any kind of new things or any kind of new, anything that will challenge us. Is anybody like to be challenged in the house tonight? Oh, yeah. That's why I'm called to be a passionate theologian. I like to push you. I like to put things. One of my professors said one time, I said, are you, put, are you giving them what you get in, in college? What you're getting in seminary? I said, well, some of that, I don't know why I'm not, I got a very intelligent group, but some, some of that stuff is, you know, over my head right now. I'm not thinking down some of those things. And he said, well, that's your responsibility to push them. That's your responsibility to teach them and challenge them and push them into new depths that they've never been. Listen, I always like to think about the three lands. Remember that sermon we preached a long time ago? I'm going to re-preach it one day. The three lands that the Israelites went through, first of all, they went to the land of not enough, not enough brick, not enough straw, not enough water, not enough freedom. Then, they, then the, the second land they went through after their, after their mass exodus from the house of Pharaoh was the land of just enough. They went to the land of just enough bread every day. Just enough water every day. Just enough fire every day. Just enough to get them by. And then finally, through the, the leadership of Joshua and Caleb. Yes, uh, Joshua, Caleb is mentioned in Joshua 14. So we know that Caleb got going into the promised land by promise. Then he went to the land of more than enough. Too many Christians are settling for the land of just enough. And let me tell you something. That is a dangerous place. Many Christians don't want to go into the place of more than enough. Let me tell you something. When you get into the land of more than enough, the land of just enough, just don't cut it no more. When you get to the land of, when you get out of church and you've got more than enough to share with the world, you can't go back to a place where there's just enough. Or you can't, you, you definitely can't stomach going to a place where there's not enough. Can I get a witness there? Yeah. Listen to me. Let me give you this one nugget while I'm here. Where some of you at are dangerous, spiritually. If you listen to me wherever you're at, and you're on the edge of the promised land, but you don't want to make it in because you don't want to overcommit. 
Uh, you want to be comfortable. When you get into the land of more than enough, you're going to go through seats of bunk. You're going to be uncomfortable. You're going to have to fight giants. You're going to have to face things that you don't want to face. Let me tell you something. Sometimes we know that where we are in dangerous, but we won't do anything about it. I call that dangerous Christianity. Staying in the land of just enough. Just, I'm like a hit of a religious moment. If I'm telling you, you are in a dangerous place. You've already been to the land of just enough. It's just one more step across Jordan to get to the land of more than enough. Somebody give God some praise there. <laughs> I often wonder why people stay where they starve to death. I get called all the time on the church. But you damn you damn it, you like a prospect I want to. But I don't. We had to have a move of God in two years in our church. I think to myself, why are you staying there? We had to have a fresh word in two. Now, that, now, that, that, now that's their rendition now. I've been suffering church hurt in my church for two years. Can, can I say this about church hurt? Everybody that comes to you talking about they've been church or ain't church or somebody tightened them up somewhere. They went against the bylaws of the church. They went against their preacher some kind of way. Now, if you have a disagreement with me, that's fine. But now, if, 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 if I'm right and I have to tighten you up about something, don't be going all over something talking about I got a church or No, you got corrected. That's all right. Can I get a witness anyway? That's your feet, you just got your pride hurt a little bit. Right. Why do people stay where they starve to death? No fire, no worship, no fasting, little prayer, little repenting. Come on, somebody. Amen. I don't want to stay where there's no fire ever. We might have to go through seasons where the services aren't as powerful as normal. But it's not normal to go a whole year in a church without a move of God. Somebody to break down do some fasting. Somebody to break the plate. Somebody say amen there. Listen. God cannot use you where you are. God don't want you dealing down any close to the edge of the land of more than enough. God's purpose for them and God's destiny with them. I'm telling my introduction. No, no, no I'm getting I'm, I, We're getting out. Some of y'all starting to panic out there. Probably got some. Do you need anybody chiming out? When I said that, I better quit messing around. God could not use Israel any longer in the capacity that He wanted to. Think about it. While they were wandering for the next 40 years in the middle, they had accomplished absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. 40 years, a whole generation. That makes me feel old because I'm fixing to be 49 in like two weekends. It's August 21st. I know I'm just picking you by saying that, right? I really am. I really am. It's just another day. It really is. God was ready for Israel to possess the promised land, but Israel was not ready to possess and fight for the promises of God. There are some promises and some visions and some callings that God has laid on your life and the enemy is going to do everything he can to keep you from the land of more than enough. I'm telling you, fight through that Jordan and possess your promise. Sometimes you've got to say on this side, I refuse to die on the wrong side of Jordan. Yeah. Look, you're here tonight, you swear go all in. This is where I keep mess, quit messing around. Listen, if you got saved, you accept that Jesus Christ is your Savior. Go ahead and get baptized. This is where I jump on me. Go ahead and get baptized in the Holy Ghost. But speaking in tongues at the end of yes, we believe in speaking with tongues. Somebody say amen there. I'm a tongue talker. I got a, a preacher friend of mine said that was for that day and not for this day. I said, you know, you know, told me too late. So I've been doing it for like 26 years. I've already been. So why do we not enter our promised lands? What's the deal? Why aren't you going deeper? Why aren't you reaching? Why aren't you fighting? The answer might shock you. It's found in Hebrews. Right, Brother Tim? <coughs> Hebrews 3 and 19. 
So we see that they could not enter in because of his word unbelief. Amen. Unbelief. This is the whole reason. Now, 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 Paul, I believe personally, Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. It certainly has his vernacular, it certainly has his li linguistics, and it certainly has his stamp and the writing all over it. But if you'll notice in some of your Bibles, if you go back and look, not now. No, I see you can look at them all too. It says uh, the, 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 the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Hebrews. And you look at another Bible, it might say uh, the book of Hebrews. That's because it's still up in the air who wrote it. So, why? Let me ask you a question. Why do you go back to our screensaver? Why do we have a hard time taking God and his word? Many times we seek and believe the word of people more than we seek and believe the word of God. Some of y'all, if you need a word from the Holy Spirit, you won't go to the Holy Spirit. You go to somebody. Why do you do that? That hurts me. I, I know people, preachers, laymen, even Christians, they'll go to everybody in the community. And you know what they're going to tell you? Well, I got a word from God one time. They got their word from God. Get your word from God. Amen. To my preachers and those you're in the call in here, get your service from God's word. Get it fresh. Listen here. No preacher can give it to you any fresher than what you get from God's word. Amen. We'll go to every prophet. We'll go to every prophetess. We'll go to every pastor. We'll go to any link, tall people, every, trying to get a word from God. And God said, my word is right here in front of you. Why would you believe the word of somebody else over the word of God? Can I get a witness there? Israel chose the word of people rather than the word of God. Ain't that a shame? Let me ask you a question tonight. Whose report are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the Lord's report? Or are you gonna put are you gonna believe man's report? Man's report can be skewed by what they're going through. You get that word from the word of God. Listen to me. Hebrews and Psalms every day is a great devotion. The daily bread is a great devotion. Take it straight from the word of God. But you can't get it no better than what you get it from God Almighty Himself through that. Bible. Read it. You'd be surprised how much that word will speak to you when you're desperate and you need it. Can I get a witness there? Yeah. You, you, you know why they didn't fight for their promise? Because they were focusing on what they saw instead of what God said. Sometimes you've got to quit focusing on what you see and focus on what God's word says. For instance, Peter, remember, he was fishing, and the Lord said, throw out the net. He said, well, I don't see the fish. I didn't see the fish all night long. Boy, bad if you go fishing, don't catch no fish. Y'all might think hard of me, especially my fishermen buddies in here, but sometimes I have to go fishing. Don't even throw out a really rod. Long as it's in nature. Mm -hmm. Looking around. He was focused on what he saw instead of what God said, instead of what Christ said. Finally, Christ said, finally, Peter said, Nevertheless, at thy word, I will cast out the net. So he quit going by what he saw and did what God. You'd be surprised what would happen if you just actually did what the Bible says. Come on, somebody. I was counseling a couple one time, marriage counseling, for like, like three years. And I, I was getting, I was getting, they were man, they were rubbing me down to the dove. I mean, I finally went and said, we're going to have a little session, but I, I don't know what else I can tell you. And they came back, thankfully they came back in a much better mood and we got, and, and, and they're still doing good today. Give God a praise for that. Amen. I had them a couple years ago. I told them they left, I said, if you, if you don't go home and you don't do what Ephesians 5 says, like we've been studying, I'm going to refer you to somebody else. You won't do what I tell you. Every time you do what Ephesians 5 says, I'm not going to tell you, go home and look it up as a husband and a wife. Every time the wife does her role, the husband does her role, his role, y'all don't have any problems. As soon as y'all get away from, why can't you just do what the word of God says? I'm going to refer you to another preacher. Well, you would do that. I said, yeah, I would do that. I'm trying to hit you on charge. Let me ask you, what is keeping you out of the promised land tonight? Your personal promised land. I wish that we had some folks in here tonight say, I will not let walls and giants and the word of people hold me from my destiny. I will not let whispers of giants, whispers of Jericho's, and whispers of all these vast people that inhabit the land. I wish that you would say, I'm not going to go by what I see. I'm going to go by what God says. If God says we can accomplish it, then my God, we can 
what's strange? And Reverend Rex and I were talking about this before the service tonight. You know what's strange? If Moses really started the unbelief, he really did. We blame the spies, but in reality, it was Moses that planted it out. Listen in Numbers 13, 17 through 19. Listen to the instructions of Moses. Now, I want you to really realize now, he doubted that the land was really good. If you go back and look in Exodus when God was talking to him, he plainly told Moses, the land flows with milk and honey. The land, the houses you don't even have to build. You just go and possess it. Then why did he send the posse out to begin with? Why did, why did he send the peoples out anyway? At first glance, at first glance, you read this and say, that's smart of him, right? Don't rush into nothing blindly. <coughs> he wanted to go by what he saw instead of what God said. I'm going to show you. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. And said unto them, Get ye up this way southward and go up into the mountain. And see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell up therein, whether they be strong or whether they be weak. Did you see the doubt and the fear? So what did they come back and say? The people of what? Strong. Duh. They went and saw that exactly what the leader said. That's why I tell my leadership all the time. If we have a rift in our leadership, you better not. You better not let it get to the people because the people are getting shaky. If you don't like something going on here, you don't go whispering to all the sheep's ears and stir them and make them stampede. You keep your mouth closed until we get things resolved. Can I get a witness? Because of that? We don't play that. Whether to be strong or weak, few or many. Look at verse number 19. And what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad. God already told him the land is good, son. Amen. And what cities they be that dwell in, whether in tents or strongholds. Matter of fact, don't, don't go there, Tim, because I didn't put this in my notes. But Exodus 3 and 8, and Exodus 13, 15, if you're scribing down notes still. Tell, God plainly tells him. Yes, they're fortified, but you're trusting in me. You're not trusting in yourself. So, as we get ready to close up, there were two complexes. Two complexes among the spies that I'm going to talk about before we get Smith, and I think this is important. So if you scribe them down, no scribe us down. An intimidation complex and a grasshopper complex. An intimidation complex, jump down right beside the scripture, it's okay to write your Bibles. It's just a book. The page part of it, not just another book. It's a book, write in it. It's okay. It calls, we call that bibliolatry. You know, you, you, think, you, know, you don't want to mark it up. Listen, that, that God's word is in his heart and in your heart. You can get other Bibles. It's, trust God, because you highlight in your Bible, it don't make that verse void. Can I get a witness? It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. So two things. <clears throat> An intimidation complex and a grasshopper complex. Listen. Their eyes, number one, intimidation, they got a complex. Some of you have a hard time entering into the land God wants you to be in because you get intimidated. But that's bigger than me, but it's not bigger than God. Amen. Brother Rex can tell you. And some of you didn't have to find out some maybe. You say you call the priest. We're going to throw some material at you. You're going to have to read, 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 read. You're going to get tested a little bit. Read, read. You're going to have to have discussions, accountability. Mm -hmm. You're going to be pushed out of your comfort zone. We'll see. Their eyes were on the obstacle, not on the God that led them there. Let me say that again. Their eyes were on the giants and the walls of what, what kind of houses they lived in. It is the will, I got to stay out here. It is the will of the enemy to keep their eyes on what makes you afraid. Whatever keeps you 
maybe somebody here tonight feels called to learn the guitar. They don't think they can learn it. They can learn it, Kenny Reverend Roy. They can learn it. Some people say, well, I would love to learn the sound, but maybe maybe get into some of the sound equipment or maybe some of the meat. They would love, they would love to train somebody, get some extra help up here. Brother Tim would love to sit up here in the front pew. What you brother Tim that way I can that way I can I can't reach you way up there. Let me stop. <clears throat> so you become afraid. Maybe you're here, you didn't call to preach in your heart. I'm afraid to get up there. I am too sometimes. Any minister in his right mind would be afraid to get up here sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. If you're not, come see me. You, you ain't really called to preach. Or you're too arrogant to preach. Either way. Amen. The ten negative spies placed their eyes on what they could not overcome rather than placing them on the God that can overcome through them. They were too worried about everything they had to overcome. When God, if you just go, I will use you as a force to be reckoned with and no man can stand your path. Do it God's way. If God be for you, who can be against you? Come on, somebody. But a rap, I chuckled when the Holy Spirit revealed this to me. Notice the believers, Joshua and Caleb, were named. The believers, the ones that believed in the promised land was for them. But all the turkeys that didn't believe, they didn't get put in there. <laughs> Nobody wants to be around somebody that doubts everything you're trying to do for the Lord. I'm going to tell you right now, if God gives our leadership a clear-cut vision and said a church is to go this way, the church has to go that way. Come on, somebody. Believers had no unbelief. They said, Listen, Moses didn't want to record the little nasty names in the book, per se. Of course, their name earlier, every spy was named. This man from this tribe, this man from this tribe. But the one that actually stood up and said, This is this and this is that, we can't do this, they were not named. Let me tell you something. The Torah, as a, as a side note, real quick, I, I know I got to hurry. The Torah was written. In a way you can teach your children. That's the way the Torah was written. The first five books of the Bible. The Pentateuch. Notice how Genesis is written. Now in the beginning. You can literally take that Bible. And sit a child down. And read that Bible to that child. That's the way the Torah was written. Well how about Leviticus. Could they understand it? And the culture of their day. They could. The wave offer. Well a child that lived in, in that day. Would know what a wave offer is. They would know how. I guarantee you a child, say Mr. Rivers' age here, a child, a, a kid here, well, a, a kid, a, 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 young, a young developing man, whatever you want to call him. I give you stuff at the church. You may feel that. Okay? He's like, I used to, Dana, I used to let him get a handful like this. You can't, you can't do it, man. He got a handful so big I had to give him a bag. And I'm like, hold let me see your hand. That's how long I had that wrestle. <coughs> They were not named because Moses did not want the, his predecessors reading off names of daughters that was in that camp under his watch of their children. Can I get a witness? Yeah. Teach your children to not doubt. Teach your children that with God all things are possible. Listen. Teach your children what God can do instead of what God cannot do because God can do anything He wants to do when He wants to do it and how He wants to do it. When you have them, teach your grandchildren what God can do instead of what He cannot do or will not do. Listen, I want to be remembered by my children and possibly my grandchildren one day that my granddaddy, Pastor Ronnie, I want to have a legacy like Tillman Floyd. You know, he's still spoken well of in our community. I still have not heard one person speak ill of that man. Two generations ahead of me. That's the kind of legacy I'm going to leave behind. Hallelujah. Somebody give God some praise to him. We're going to move to our last section. Sometimes you've got to go through your enemy to get where God wants you to go. 
this cake, the path, honey, that God has for you to go down, there might be giants in that path, but that's God's path. And when you arrive at that giant, when you arrive at that crisis, or when you arrive at that place, I can tell you God's already been in your future, and He's already fixed up a way of an escape. When you arrive, everything is there for you to survive. It won't overtake you. The river won't overtake you. The fire will not. The crisis will not take up your whole life. Come on, somebody. He's been there for you. spoke about Jericho. Jericho's already given into your hands, Mr. David. All you got to do is do, walk around, blow the trumpets like I tell you to, and the city's yours. It's already been taken. That's why I'm trying to teach some of you tonight. But you don't know my circumstance. Grasshopper. Let's do it in our last spot. You're such a grasshopper. You little grasshopper. No one you can't handle victory. Brother Tim, did you have any scroll like I to get the beginning of my sermon to get that verse? That means you're almost done. 33, please, sir. 13, 33. I want you to notice something I never really completely caught before until I was studying. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Now, now you look at that and you say, duh, that's kind of, that's kind of but do you realize, let, let me put you this way. How you see yourself determines the way the enemy sees you. Yeah. Let me say that again. How you see yourself is how the enemy sees you. So they sold their self as insignificant. And so were we in their sight. You're caught in the heart. That's good stuff, ain't it? We were in our own sight. See, some of you cannot go in and possess the promised land because in your own sight, you're just a grasshopper. God can't use me to do this or God can't use me to do that because I'm just a grasshopper. And the enemy is licking his child, looking at you, and so you are in my sight. If you present yourself as a servant, a promise fighter. I mean, a, a, when they fight for their promises, Satan can say, yes, we can attack him, but you're going to get scratched up. You might bang him up. You might put a war wound on her or him, but you're going to come out with an eye missing. You're going to come out with scraped up shins. I probably shouldn't tell you all this, but I'll tell you what. Somebody try to jump in. I'm just being a mean little rascal. Boy. I was mean as a rattlesnake. I had a waist and a neck. I was about 33 in the waist. This person about 330 pounds. I got short arms. Then I went run up me one time. I took the heel. I had on cowboy boots. I took the heel of my shoe right down the shin. He said, oh, 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 oh. I said, don't hop on that. I said, oh, I got to finish it. Yeah, look at that. I did mean me and give Huh? You put, the, you, put, you put the more cowboy boot toe around that shin. I don't care how big he is. Well, he, let me stop. This is, what it, this is what the enemy is saying. You can jump on her, but you're going to get your shin skimp up. You can jump on him, but you're going to have patches of hair missing out of your head. Go jump on the grasshopper over there. Always pray. Always easy. Always an easy meal. Amen. That's what I'm trying to say. Well, some of y'all ain't like grasshoppers all the time. Always pray. You need to look. Listen, Israel was supposed to be the predator, not prey. As we saw ourselves, so the enemy saw them. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I'm asking our musicians to come back, please. I believe that they was going through Jericho. Someone was on the wall. What are y'all doing down there? They looked at me and got afraid and said, We're just tourists. We won't be here long. I believe when they were passing across the <coughs> Amorites and the Amalekites, and they jumped over and said, what are y'all doing here? Oh, we're, we're, we're just here visiting. We're just passing through. We won't, we won't be here long. I can promise you, brother, I can promise you, somewhere, some tent, or some stump, or some river, somebody about two or three men had to get Caleb in the head lock and hollow. I'll be back. I guarantee you, there was somebody trying to hold back Joshua from pulling his sword and wiped out about 20,000 of us. So can I get a witness? Amen. I guarantee that about 10 
grown man sitting on top of Caleb's head say, don't you open your mouth. Don't you? That's why I believe Caleb was saved the whole time in Sarita. We're lions. And we're being treated like grasshoppers. We are the, we are the sons of the king of kings and the lord of lords. He can open up a whole sea. He can swallow these people up in victory. Somebody better give God a bow. Let me leave you with this. Not only did they see themselves as grasshoppers, Mr. Ron, but they saw everybody around them as grasshoppers. We saw ourselves. Don't include me. What are you, what are you a little grasshopper group? Don't include me in that group. If you want to be weak and frail, always, always getting the butt end of it, always getting messed up. You know, all of us all, 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 all of the beating every now and then. I, I told him I should beat myself. But don't be looking around talking about Smithfield. We all grass off. You speak for yourself, honey. You speak. We got lions around here. Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. If they saw themselves as grasshoppers, that's how they saw their grandchildren and their great grandchildren. Let me tell you something. Stop limiting your children. Stop telling them they're small. Tell them they're large. Tell them you don't believe. You don't belong in the land of just enough. Michael, you belong in the land of more than enough. And I refuse to raise you to stay in the land of not enough or just enough. You're going to be prosperous one day. You are the predator and not the predator. I don't see grasshoppers in here tonight. I see demolition experts who are ready to tear down some walls. Do we have any demolition experts in here tonight that say, I'm going to fight and I'm going to possess my promise? Do we have any harvesters in here tonight that's ready to harvest some milk and honey? Do we have any giant slayers? Come on, somebody. We don't need no grasshoppers. We need some giant killers. We need some wall breakers. Can I get a witness? You need a predator mentality instead of a prey mentality. I need some folks who are tired of having a grasshopper, tired of getting stepped on. Anything can beat up a grasshopper. Just about it, right? I mean, even a tiny, I lost a little tiny little lizard the other day. Swallow a grasshopper. You need to quit looking at yourself so small. Come on, musicians, play us a song tonight. I will not be defeated. Come on. Come on, if you're a giant slayer, rise to your feet tonight and give God some worship. If you're tired of being a grasshopper and you're ready to be a lion, stand to your feet tonight and give God some worship before we dismiss.